Dr. Maciej Bartkowski is the Senior Director for Education and Research at ICNC. Before joining ICNC, he worked as a lecturer, a visiting faculty member, and a director of academic programs at a number of academic institutions in the United States, Central and Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. He has taught at Bard College's Globalization and International Affairs Program in New York, the Open Society Institute Undergraduate Exchange Program, Adelphi University, and at the Academy of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. He has also done research at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, at a traineeship at the European Parliament. He was a European Union observer of the Lebanese parliamentary elections in 2005 and the OSCE election supervisor in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1997. He holds a PhD in political science and an MA in international relations and European studies from Central European University in Budapest. He completed his undergraduate work at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and he speaks fluent English, Polish, and Russian, as well as basic Ukrainian and German. Dr. Bartkowski is currently working on an edited volume, Rediscovering the Forgotten History of Civil Resistance and Independent Struggles. With that, I'd like to hand it over to our presenter, Dr. Maciej Bartkowski. Uh, thank you very much, Darren. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, depending on the time zone. Um, my, uh, the title of my presentation is Civil Resistance as a Foundation of Democracy to be and the legacy of nonviolent struggle in, in the democratization of Poland. And this two-tier title suggests that I will be looking both at the uh, analytical um, uh, framework of understanding uh, the impact of civil resistance as well as um, empirical case study of Poland that um, hopefully will illustrate that long-term impact of civil resistance. Um, the, the basic question of my presentation is whether there is a link between uh, the practice of civil resistance and democratic outcome or the liberal outcome. And if there is uh, such a linkage, if there is such a connection, uh, then I'm, I'm interested in essentially uh, trying to investigate uh, the, uh, or trying to understand how we can investigate the impact of, of residual effects of civil resistance on political processes after the struggle ends. And this is essentially more kind of epistemological and methodological question. And, and then how uh, those residual lasting effects are really reflected in practice, how they are visible, which is more uh, an, an empirical inquiry and that would take us then to the discussion of the of the Polish case. And the assumption, the basic assumption of this of this presentation is that the kind of civil resistance wage, the type of democratic transition occurs, the type of trajectory, space, scope and uh, of democratic uh, transformation will, will, will take place. Um, there is really not uh, much uh, written uh, on on the subject of long-term impact of civil resistance. Uh, the, um, the existing uh, uh, quantitative study that um, um, that is uh, that is uh, out there that uh, it's quite relevant to today's presentation is uh, um, uh, was produced by uh, Freedom House uh, by uh, Adrian Karatnitsky and Peter Ackerman, uh, where uh, the authors were looking uh, at the transitions that occurred in the last three years um, um, until. 2005, they they uh, they look at 67 transitions, and they discovered that the civilian-led um, um, force, the the, uh, the the civilian resistance force, was a key factor in um, in uh, 50 of those transitions. Uh, in com in contrast to um, uh, 14 that were essentially top-down transitions, uh, facilitated facilitated mainly by Elite negotiations. Uh, what was probably even more important, particularly for this for this presentation, is they um, discovered that um, uh, 32 of those countries, uh, out of 50 that went for the kind of bottom-up transition, are uh, today free. Uh, and uh, there was um, um, an explicit um, connection made between uh, the civil resistance, the existence of the uh, of the powerful civilian-led force that um, um, uh, pushed for the transition and eventual um, uh, successful democratization in those, in those countries. 
However, there could be one note of caution uh, made here uh, because uh, out of this 32 um, uh, countries that are right now free and, and experience bottom-up transitions, almost half of them are countries that are um, located in Central Eastern Europe. And when one analyzes the democratization in that region um, between 1918, 1989 and, and 2005 when, when the study was uh, finalized, one can um, uh, think about also other um, factors other than, than legacy of civil resistance that might have played an important role in democratization in that region. And uh, they were not uh, so much, uh, those factors were not so much based in um, uh, inside of those countries, but, but actually out, outside of those countries, such as European integration and, and NATO enlargement. So then the question is how to essentially um, um, determine an independent impact of, of civil resistance uh, um, uh, next to other possible factors that might have played a role in, in democratization of those countries, and which I hopefully will be able also to address in that presentation. Um, before we will talk about uh, uh, the long-term impact of civil resistance, I think um, we should first uh, talk briefly about what civil resistance is and what, how one can understand civil resistance. And in, uh, in my own understanding, civil resistance that is very much uh, um, placed in the tradition of the scholarship of strategic nonviolent uh, conflict is oftentimes um, understood as, uh, uh, as a kind of formula, as uh, instrumental formula, formula of tactics and strategies of how to wage nonviolent struggle and uh, as a kind of contest, almost physical contest between um, uh, those who uh, are uh, challenging the power and those who are um, challenged. Um, however, uh, civil resistance could be understood uh, much broadly. Uh, it could be viewed as, um, um, as a social phenomenon, as a phenomenon of social life. Uh, some authors um, talk about civil resistance as an incubator of democracy, as a school of liberty, as a, uh, as a kind of equivalence of rule of law and force of association life, uh, which goes much beyond the kind of uh, instrumental mechanic logic of disruption, oppression. Um, and in that sense, civil resistance could be, um, could be viewed as a set of interactions between people, uh, starting from tens, hundreds, then uh, going to tens of, uh, tens of hundreds and, 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 and uh, um, hundreds of thousands of people that join the movement. Uh, and those, uh, those people are not only involved in certain interactions, but they are building certain institutions, understood quite broadly as rules, norms, uh, that might have an autonomous uh, impact on, on environment and on the, on the people. Uh, in, that, in that sense, uh, actually civil resistance, um, in, that, in defining that way, could um, resemble um, uh, very closely social capital, uh, the way um, sociologists, political scientists, are writing about social capital. If one uh, reads Patnam, Coleman, uh, Bourdieu, Fukuyama, essentially the, the social capital is it's very much defined um, uh, through the perspective of institutions, institutions understood as values, norms, and procedures, and interactions, human, human relations. And um, also in the literature on the social capital, um, um, one could come across of the different types of social capital um, in, order to in order to talk about the uh, propitious uh, impact on the emergence of uh, civil society. So bonding social capital, bridging social capital, linking social capital. And essentially the literature points to bridging social capital is the one that is very beneficial for, for the emergence of, of civil society as, as it brings together people that essentially are not of the same views. Uh, they, they may come from different classes, different uh, ages, um, um, having uh, different types of uh, professional experience, and they still um, kind of interact with one another and, and build um, different associations. And uh, civil resistance um, actually uh, facilitates um, a formation of all types of social capital, uh, both bonding uh, between a kind of nucleus, nucleus group that is uh, essentially building up the movement, and then when the movement is growing up and, and extending its, uh, its reach to different groups, um, um, uh, with, with different beliefs, with different convictions, 
Uh, that's where the bridging social capital occurs. And finally, linking social, social capital, it's when the civil resistance, that is, if it's a healthy civil resistance, by, by its own nature, it's, it's moderate. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, reaching out to, uh, to, to, those, to the group that is actually trying to challenge in order to engage in a dialogue. And this is a kind of uh, interaction with the people in power to win them over. And that's where oftentimes the loyalty shifts uh, occur. Um, now, um, I, was, I was also interested in um, how, how um, civil resistance might influence the size of that social capital. Um, I, um, I was looking at the, at the tactics of, of civil resistance, and this is only the, uh, probably the, uh, at this stage it's an intuitive um, uh, judgment on, on how the tactics of civil resistance might influence the creation of the social capital during the resistance struggle. Um, uh, basically, one could differentiate between two types of uh, tactics, uh, tactics of commission and, and tactics of omission. Um, the, the, essentially, the acts of commission, it's, um, it's doing something that the government uh, or the authority doesn't want people to do. Uh, that may include petitions, strikes, demonstrations, and building parallel institutions. And acts of omissions include um, not doing something that authorities would expect um, uh, people to to do, and um, and if one would look at the some kind of index of civicness, if one would create that index and look at the size of the of the uh, participation uh, at the kind of uh, um, uh, thickness of the human interactions and the uh, at the uh, outcomes of those acts that um, would have more kind of sustainable effects and and would require also greater material resources. Actually, those um, those uh, features could be common for the acts of omission. Uh, acts of I'm sorry, acts of commission. Acts of omission would usually um, uh, would rely on on acts of individuals. Uh, would uh, those effects might be more kind of immediate and less resources would need to be mobilized. Um, so um, and and the examples of acts of commission include um, election boycotts, tax refusal, um, and kind of general refusal to cooperate with the government. Um, now, um, the question is, uh, what social capital can civil resistance generate? Um, and I will try to, uh, using the case of, of uh, uh, Polish resistance movement, I will try to illustrate that uh, with concrete examples. Right now, this is kind of general um, um, summary of, of certain social capital that could be generated um, by the healthy uh, civil resistance. Um, social capital uh, that could establish a certain template for future power arrangements based on a decentralized and pluralistic governance. Social capital of, of self-organization uh, that um, sets up a template for uh, future institutionalist practices in civic realm, essential emergence of the civil society. Uh, social capital of individual empowerment and civic uh, and economic entrepreneurship. Um, civil, uh, uh, social capital of collective actions, uh, setting up a certain template for uh, waging um, non-violent uh, actions already in, in democracy, and, uh, and uh, uh, social capital of moderation and, and self-limitation that is characteristic for um, civil resistance movements. And uh, finally, uh, social capital that is generated through civil resistance that has influence on collective identities and, and certain worldviews and perception of where the people are uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, regional or international um, developments. Now, I would like to um, come to um, our empirical case. This is a, a, a I call it a historical historical cardiogram of civil resistance in Poland that was created um, at the beginning of the 80s uh, in Poland, which, um, which looks at uh, different um, periods of time of, of, of the kind of tradition of resistance in Poland. Um, 1956, 68, 70, 76, and 80, this was the resistance, this was the no nonviolent resistance that occurred during the uh, uh, that, that occurred in Poland against the, the communist government. Um, uh, the difference between those 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 times um, uh, was based on essentially the groups that were participated in that resistance. 56, that was the workers uh, that uh, demonstrated against um, the communist government. 68 intellectuals, and 70, 76, uh, they were they were workers. Um, 
1980 was a uh, was a, uh, a bit different story about which I will I will speak in a moment. But here I would like to uh, mention one uh, one date uh, which is 1944, which is actually armed resistance um, um, that um, uh, took place uh, in in Poland in Warsaw against against um, uh, uh, Germans, and it was very very bloody resistance, and it's still solidarity as this kind of uh, cardiogram depicts, uh, has its roots in this kind of type of resistance. And um, uh, this, is, this is essentially uh, um, a kind of evidence that, um, first of all, the choice of nonviolent methods um, uh, during the, uh, the communist rule by, uh, by uh, opposition and, and solidarity, uh, it was a very pragmatic choice. It was a it was very strategic choice um, um, because uh, the perception was that this was the the only um, effective actual instrument against against the communist government. But uh, the transition of resistance uh, was coming back um, to to even violent uh, insurrections that uh, Poland um, experienced. Um, but then, due to um, um, certain understanding of the power of nonviolent resistance, uh, this uh, this kind of type of tactics were incorporated. Uh, during the uh, the communist uh, uh, period. Now, uh, in seventies, what happened in, in seventies uh, uh, with, with Polish resistance? Um, essentially, the new type of um, uh, uh, qualitatively new and quantitatively new type of resistance uh, began emerging. Uh, first of all, in terms of the kind of qualitative change, uh, it was the uh, emphasis on uh, creating underground society. Instead of burning party committees, let's build uh, our own committees, as one of the leaders of the solidarity, uh, of the future solidarity movement was, was saying. Um, so essentially the emphasis was on liberating. It, it was not so much on um, uh, challenging directly the power of the communist government, but actually on liberating society from the, from the control of the government. And here I would like to quickly uh, quote a uh, for you, one of the uh, leaders of the of the movement who kind of described, I think, quite aptly the um, this kind of new type of uh, tactics, uh, where the government would no longer control empty shops, but um, where, where the government would actually control empty shops, but not the market. The government would control employment, but not the means to livelihood. Um, the government would control the state. Uh, press, but not the publishing movement. The government would control telephones and postal services, but not communication. The government would control schools, but not education. Uh, and this was this was the kind of new tactic that uh, from from 70s um, the the, uh, the movement uh, began employing. Uh, then, in terms of the quantitative change, it was uh, uh, the movement started building coalition across various various groups. Um, before uh, the resistance was carried either by intellectuals on their own or by workers on their own. Uh, after 1976, uh, this uh, the, the resistance um, uh, got united, and um, and you had various, and we had various, and Poland experienced various uh, kind of coalition uh, building initiatives between workers and um, and intellectuals. Uh, um, uh, with, with, the, with the support of the um, uh, Catholic uh, Church and clergy, farmers and students uh, joined uh, also then different professional groups such as doctors, lawyers, writers, um, and there were a number of Catholic, Catholic, um, Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, events and, and factors that contributed to the emergence of this broad uh, alliance um, that was also very much be, um, uh, based on building different types of uh, civic uh, institutions and organizations independent of the, uh, of the government. And, um, and here, uh, one of the catalytic events uh, was actually the killing of the 20-year-old um, student, um, Stanislav Pejas, uh, by the uh, security uh, force. Uh, and uh, this, uh, those, those pictures, they are uh, taken from, from the funeral of the, of the student. Essentially, the killing of that student galvanized the whole student population in Poland and led to the creation uh, of the independent student associations. Uh, another catalytic event um, that uh, took place in Poland was the election of the 
um, of the uh, Polish uh, uh, cardinal, as said, Pope John uh, uh, II. Um, uh, he uh, was elected in 1978. It was um, it was uh, quite a significant election because this was the first non-Italian pope uh, since 16th uh, century, um, and that then the pope was coming from the from the communist country, and uh, and had a very radical views on 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 um, uh, on the on the transformation of those countries and to to bring them closer to democracy and and respect of human rights. He traveled to Poland in 1979, and you could see those crowds um, uh, who greeted him. Um, before Poles, those who were engaged in resistance, involved in resistance, they, they knew when they said they, they knew what they meant. They, they, they could visualize the kind of the communist um, oppressors, and they called them they, but they, they could never visualize us. Whereas with the visit of Pope, when um, um, hundreds of thousands and millions of people came to the streets, they could finally, uh, final, finally visualize what us meant, and which was uh, which played a very important psychological role in uh, consolidating the movement, um, and um, and then um, after the Pope visit uh, and and um, and deterioration of, of economic situation uh, in Poland uh, in August 1980, uh, we had a massive uh, uh, strikes um, uh, by workers and by various actually pro profession professionals uh, demanding. Um, one of the of, of the demands was uh, to establish uh, free trade unions. Under the pressure of this um, of this um, uh, massive uh, mobilization and participation, um, uh, the uh, uh, the communist uh, government essentially uh, allowed to uh, legalize solidarity, uh, and um, within a couple of weeks, uh, up to 10 million people joined uh, uh, joined the uh, the movement. It was probably uh, a very unique um, uh, event in the in, in, in the history of the world when essentially a quarter of the society joined a single organization um, um, with the purpose of democratizing the the country. But uh, uh, there were around 80 percent of the workforce of the of the workforce in Poland joined Solidarity at that time. A Communist Party uh, lost around uh, two three million of its members. Um, the, the the emergence of the solidarity was really a, a phenomenon, um, and um, it's uh, solidarity was was using various various tactics of of resistance, um, and most of those tactics, if one would look carefully and analyze them carefully, would point at, would point to to the fact that uh, those tactics uh, could be grouped as, uh, as acts of uh, commission those tactics that essentially were generating uh, a, a quite large and sophisticated social capital later on needed for the um, for the emergence of the civil society and democracy in Poland, uh, particularly building the underground society, independent and, and and free of the government control, as one of the acts of as one of the tactics of commission uh, created a significant. Um, a significant um, amount of social capital needed then for for a successful democratic uh, transformation. Solidarity was a uh, was a phenomenon um, um, was a social phenomenon of of living within the truth. If one analyzes interviews with with those people who were part of the movement, uh, one uh, can um, can see the extent to which. Um, uh, uh, such virtues like uh, mutual responsibility, trust, loyalty uh, were present. Also, the more kind of uh, um, um, uh, kind of modes of interactions, such as decentralized uh, uh, and 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 uh, localized um, actions that were encouraged by the solidarity, um, uh, were present in the movement. Um, and and natural different um, uh, people from from all walks of life join it. Um, then develops developments uh, in uh, between 1981 and uh, 1989 very quickly um, uh, in response to the growing um, threat from the solidarity and growing power of solidarity the communist uh, government decided to introduce martial law arrested um, more than uh, 3,000 uh, um, solidarity leaders uh, 10,000 were placed in, in preventive detention 
And um, however, the, the martial law hasn't solved um, um, or hasn't uh, achieved its, its object in terms of eliminating um, the, um, the solidarity from, um, um, from, from the Polish kind of political scene. Um, actually, the solidarity le uh, leaders were released uh, uh, between 18, uh, 1983 and 1986, and essentially Poland uh, was in a kind of stalemate. Um, neither side could really win the, um, uh, the struggle. And uh, with the deterioration of the economic situation and then uh, ongoing um, uh, strikes and demonstrations, the communist government uh, decided to um, enter into negotiations with the with the solidarity, and that's where the roundtable discussion started in 1989 in February, April. This is the setup of that roundtable talks um, that lasted almost um, uh, two two months, uh, and um, these talks actually, and and here where and this is the uh, this is the the kind of moment where I would like to talk more about the, the social capital. Um, so if one looks at the roundtable talks, one sees the kind of s social capital of moderation and self-limitation in action. Actually, the, na the nature of solidarity that was, that was coming back to uh, 60s, 70s, uh, the, the, the resistance that was, uh, uh, that was emerging during those times, was very much rooted in, in a kind of compromise, in a dialogue, in negotiations that uh, eventually played a very much a very important role in convincing the communist leaders that uh, they have a responsible uh, party to negotiate with. Uh, this this kind of responsible movement was actually giving um, uh, to the communist leaders um, uh, a hope that um, uh, that there is indeed a life and even better life after communism that they could be part of that of the creation of that uh, or, or, or a building of that new life. Uh, and um, another important social capital that was generated um, uh, through the civil resistance um, was very much visible. Uh, it was self-organization that was very much visible again in action uh, after the end of the roundtable talks, uh, during which there was an agreement that there would be open election campaign uh, for uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, that were to take place in June 1989. This open election campaign was the first one since 1945. There was no really experience, uh, particularly on, uh, in Poland, of, of the free election campaigns. Uh, and, and that's where the, uh, this, this uh, capital of self-organization that was generated by civil resistance played an important role in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the successful uh, election campaign led by Solidarity. And uh, one of the kind of uh, symbols of this innovative, in, of this creativity, of this writing, publishing, and marketing skills that were very much developed underground as part of the, this underground society was um, was very much illustrated by this poster. Uh, this is, um, and uh, some of you may recognize uh, Gary Cooper, um, uh, and uh, that's from the Western film High Noon. Um, and the elections were taking place on June 4th, 1989. Um, you, essentially, there was a new, sher a new sheriff in town, uh, Solidarity. Um, you see that badge uh, on, 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 on Gary Cooper's um, uh, rest. And, uh, um, and, this, uh, the, uh, and another important feature that was um, connected with the nonviolent tradition that Solidarity um, uh, advanced was that instead of revolver, he was holding a ballot box. Uh, essentially, he was voting for democracy and peaceful transition. So um, uh, the, the, the skillful uh, election campaign actually allowed um, solidarity to take um, uh, most of the seats in, in both houses in 1989. Another uh, uh, type of social capital that was generated by civil resistance uh, is connected with individual em empowerment and entrepreneurship. Actually, um, uh, civil resistance in Poland um, should not be purely uh, understood as, 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 as the driving force for political freedoms. Uh, people were part of the movement because they were also demanding and expecting economic freedoms, uh, uh, which was uh, somehow illustrated, that kind of expectation and desire, by, by a huge uh, second economy or the kind of black economy, black market that was developing under communism, uh, outside of the control of the communist government. Uh, and also uh, a high public support that was maintained during uh, 
uh, the quite painful uh, transformation, uh, the, 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 uh, the high public support for the market economic reforms indicated the extent to which uh, uh, people were kind of longing for these economic uh, um, freedoms. The fact that there was no uh, significant anti-marketization forces uh, present during the transition also indicates uh, this kind of um, uh, longing for um, releasing the kind of energy for economic and, and, and civic entrepreneurship. Um, and it's, it's kind of um, uh, interesting that when Poland joined uh, EU in 2004, um, suddenly France and, and Germany and other countries, the old kind of countries of the EU, discovered that Poland's um, kind of economic outlook was much more liberal, much more a free market economy uh, uh, oriented than they own than they own um, 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 uh, that France and, and Germany had. Um, another um, capital um, that civil resistance generated was the capital of collective actions and uh, they um, uh, and they moderate nature. Actually, two uh, two Polish scholars uh, who published the book Rebellious Civil Society and look at that civil society between 19. 1989 and 1993, just immediately after the, the changes, they um, discovered that um, uh, the mobilization, mo mobilized workforce that was mobilized during the civil, uh, civil resistance years uh, was very much alive uh, during that time. And actually Poland experienced the largest number of uh, strikes and um, uh, protests among all uh, 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 among the group of, of, the, of the countries in the region that uh, went through the transition. But uh, the authors uh, actually uh, conclude uh, that um, it, those demonstrations, this kind of rebellious civil society, uh, uh, it has very, very much self-limited nature. Uh, they, um, they demonstrations uh, would not question the direction, uh, the kind of general directions of economic changes and economic transformation they may have uh, questions more the kind of specific policies regarding specific industry, regarding specific factory. And actually, they, uh, the authors are, are claiming that this rebellious civil society was actually helpful for this young democracy that hasn't yet had established uh, strong uh, political parties or interest groups that would channel uh, the, this kind of discontent. So this discontent was channeled through the, um, uh, uh, through the venues that were very familiar to, to uh, to the society through the protests and demonstration. Um, another um, uh, kind of capital that civil resistance generated was connected with um, uh, the way the governments and, and, and uh, decision making um, uh, was arranged after, uh, immediately after um, uh, Solidarity took power in 1989. Um, uh, in, uh, in fall of 1989, uh, the uh, the solidarity government agreed on, on introducing um, uh, decentralization reforms that establish um, uh, autonomous uh, rural and urban com uh, communes uh, with uh, with quite uh, significant local competences um, uh, for managing uh, health uh, um, for man managing for example education health uh, ser services and other kind of local local services in, in the area. Uh, and what was probably even more interesting is that par as, par as part of that um, uh, reforms, um, uh, the, the legislation introduced uh, or set up a civic organization that was apolitical and independent from the government that was um, made responsible for training um, public, local public officials. And, and educating uh, local public officials, and this kind of civic organization um, uh, was um, was very much uh, there because of the thinking of the civil resistance resistance leaders of the importance of the kind of grassroots organizations in in changing um, uh, the governance. Uh, then uh, political empowerment, one of the uh, so, uh, social capitals that were released. Uh, that were uh, kind of created during the civil resistance and released once the change uh, took place was the kind of political empowerment where which was uh, in, in practice reflected in a fragmentation of the political scene. There were more than 29 parties, for example, in the parliament, representing the parliament in 1991 elections. Uh, but again, uh, one could uh, make an argument, possible argument, that fragmentation didn't weaken democracy, but actually 
uh, strengthen it by increasing uh, representation uh, of the various uh, various uh, diverse interests in the in the parliament. Um, I'm coming to the end. Uh, there will be uh, one or two more slides. Um, another uh, civil resistance capital uh, uh, is connected with um, uh, with uh, civic empowerment and self-organization. Essentially, after the 19 and after the, the change of the 1989, there was an, uh, an outburst of uh, uh, civil society activities, uh, illustrated, for example, in the number of uh, civil society organizations that have been created. Uh, in the 1990s, in comparison with what with those numbers being created in, in um, a decade earlier, uh, and um, another group that was that was that became quite visible, um, the, fem the Polish feminist movement, uh, which uh, uh, whose roots were were also in the in civil resistance, uh, particularly after intro introduction of the martial law, when um, uh, those 3,000 uh, solidarity leaders. Uh, Mostly men were arrested. Uh, a number of women became uh, leaders uh, in the uh, in the underground um, press, in the underground organizations, and um, that could be uh, almost the kind of the roots of the of uh, of the feminist uh, of the emancipation of women and, and, and feminist movement in in Poland that uh, became much more uh, developed once the uh, changes occurred uh, after 1989. Finally. Uh, uh, an important, I think, civil resistance capital. Um, uh, it's uh, it's related to uh, establishing the kind of new worldview of of the kind of Poland's uh, European identity. Uh, uh, the discussions within the civil resistance uh, circles uh, that took place uh, that started already in 50s and 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 uh, went through 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, was how Poland should look like uh, after the transition. And uh, the emphasis was on the return of Poland to the democratic community of nations, to the kind of European uh, cultural and, and, and political roots. And, uh, and after 1989, there was a kind of rediscovering of new Polish identity, but within the kind of European one. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, civil resistance helped to, o to overcome any narrow ethnic Polish nationalist that, for example, was very much present after Poland regained its independence after the First World War, this time, and I would uh, link that strongly with uh, with um, the dialogue, discussions, and and uh, uh, exchanges of views uh, during the civil resistance struggles, that uh, those those these dialogues could uh, eventually uh, they they, all, they eventually help to uh, surmount uh, uh, an our ethnic Polish nationalism. Uh, and substitute it with more universal principles uh, such as freedom, human rights, international peace, solidarity, and community of democratic, democratic nations. Um, I will end here, and um, I will welcome your questions. Thank you, Dr. Barkowski, for a great presentation. I want to remind everybody that uh, if you have a question, you can click on the little raise hand button and then I will unmute you, and we'd love to hear your voice, have you introduce yourself and ask your question directly to Dr. Bartkowski. Um, but you can also type your question into the question dialog box, which is also on your control panel. So either of those will work. If you type it in, I'll, I'll read your question for you. So I believe we already have one question from uh, Marie Odendahl, and she writes, how did individualism fit in with solidarity? Mm. Very good question. There was, uh, um, on the surface, one could uh, see that there were certain um, um, uh, contradictions, individualism versus solidarism. And this was actually the result of, of, of the fact that the solidarity was uh, bringing um, um, essentially groups uh, from different political uh, uh, spectrum uh, with different socio-economic uh, uh, views, and um, in this particular case, um, uh, during the struggle, the differences were naturally muted. Uh, they became much more visible uh, uh, during um, uh, during democratic transformation, when essentially there were a number of parties that emerged from solidarity. Um, but um, the individualism was really um, based on this economic freedoms, on this, uh, on this uh, economic entrepreneurship, on, on this uh, uh, kind of right of, of, 
of an individual to engage in, in economic activities, uh, whereas the, the kind of uh, solidaris uh, would be more connected with, uh, with um, the kind of mutual uh, help and uh, eventually also with the rise of the uh, civil society in Poland. So um, uh, despite the fact that, uh, as I said on the surface, that they may have contradicted with one another, they actually then eventually left the legacies that either reinforced, for example, um, um, uh, the uh, economic reforms or, or um, uh, significantly contributed to the rise of civil society. But again, also the differences, uh, whether they were political or social or differences regarding uh, future social economic changes, they were muted during the struggle uh, because everyone was interested in, um, in establishing uh, democracy uh, uh, and only then um, kind of um, uh, establish their own groups, their own organizations which would uh, function within a democratic uh, framework with their own kind of agendas. Okay, our next question comes from Lester Kurtz. Uh, Lester, go ahead with your question. Introduce yourself and go ahead with your question. Hi, this is uh, Lester Kurtz from George Mason University. And uh, great presentation, much I really uh, find it fascinating. So I, was, I was wondering if you could say some more about um, this tension between Polish nationalism and the, and the broader, more transcendent goals. And um, I'm wondering if it's possible that that part of the success of solidarity was not uh, just a matter of uh, moving from narrow nationalism to tra to the transcendent goals, but being able somehow to embrace both poles of that tension. It, is, it seemed like they were they were able to draw on nationalism plus the broader goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Les. Uh, Yes, uh, there was um, uh, in the um, in the tradition of the solidarity movement. Um, there was uh, uh, the emphasis on the uh, on the independence struggle. Um, so the, uh, the nationalism actually was reflected in in um, uh, in the struggle against uh, um, kind of foreign occupier, uh, and we have to. We have to remember that in Poland uh, in, in 70s and 80s, there were around uh, 70, uh, 80,000 uh, Soviet troops stationing that time. So uh, uh, the fact that civil resistance was um, uh, directly um, aiming at the Polish communist government didn't, um, 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 was, was also kind of uh, uh, indicative of the of the uh, resistance towards uh, a kind of outside force that kept this Polish government in place. Um, so there was this kind of um, uh, national um, resistance present during the solidarity. But at the same time, uh, where this um, um, transformation uh, of, of the thinking about uh, who we are or who Poles are and uh, what is their place in the uh, in the kind of regional community of nations happened was actually the uh, the, uh, uh, the relations between Poles and, and Belarusians, relations between Poles and Lithuanians, relations between Poles and, and Ukrainians, as well as actually relations between Poles and, and Germans. Um, uh, the fact that uh, after the transition happened, uh, the Polish nationalists didn't take a route and uh, didn't kind of hijack the discourse about, let's say, Polish national minorities that are living in Ukraine, that are living in Ukraine, in, in, in Belarus, in, in Lithuania. Uh, uh, this, is, this is illustrative of, of the way that transformation happened. In other words, uh, uh, Poland, although uh, Polish nationalists could have used the kind of ethnic card uh, in order to try to win some kind of political um, 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 benefits, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, maybe trying to garner more support for the political platform. This uh, hasn't really kind of uh, emerged. Uh, the Polish nationalists, so Polish nationalists uh, 
when it was uh, quite visible in the recent years, it was during the integration with the EU, when when indeed uh, certain fears of the um, uh, of the integration with the uh, secular European Community were raised by um, conservatives and and also by the uh, Polish Catholic Church, and then there was kind of uh, assertion of the of the Polishness um, uh, during the debate uh, with uh, during the debate that preceded the uh, the integration with the EU. But then even the referendum uh, um, that decided about uh, Poland joining the EU was, um, uh, it wasn't a, a huge landslide, but still quite a significant landslide. Uh, and of those who supported uh, Poland's integration with the EU, that essentially won uh, the day. Um, so uh, the nationalists actually took it a different forms. On one hand, it wasn't an, 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 an extreme version of nationalism that would probably steer tensions between Poland and, and its neighbors uh, and would use the kind of ethnic minority card. Um, and um, and then it was channeled uh, a bit differently. Um, during the Solidarity Movement, it was indirectly challenging the Soviet Union presence in Poland and then, um, uh, and then re reappeared um, uh, when Poland entered the um, uh, the negotiations um, after 1993 and then in now after 1998 with the EU. Great, thank you, Dr. Bartkowski. Our next question comes from Ben Cumbo, and he writes, Hi, my name is Ben Cumbo from the Near Eastern Affairs Bureau at the Department of State. My question for Mr. Bartkowski is whether or not the Polish example of solidarity can be effectively applied to efforts to democratize in the Middle East? Um, I would be uh, I would be always caution about um, taking uh, a specific case study and using that as a kind of template uh, and an instrument to analyze um, uh, other struggles uh, and uh, which would be usually specific uh, for for the country where they are taking place uh, because of the uh, of the specific political, uh, social, cultural conditionalities present there. Um, I think that um, when I was uh, referring to um, uh, various tactics, um, the tactics of omission and commission and uh, the size of the social capital, perhaps here one generalization could be made that if one thinks about, if indeed this is this is correct, uh, that kind of hypothesis, then um, uh, if one thinks about more durable outcomes while the civil resistance is ongoing and civil resistance is thinking not only for the short-term perspective but long-term perspective in terms of democratization after the struggle ends, uh, the, the use of non-violent tactics of a commission were particularly based on building um, uh, uh, parallel structures, building essentially an underground society that would be freed from the control of the of the government, might be one of the ways to to think about, uh, uh, or in one of the ways to increase probability of democratic, successful democratic transformation. Uh, so, I would not uh, go um, to such an extent as say that um, solidarity is 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 an example that could be used uh, in other countries. Uh, actually, uh, for example, in Russia there is uh, an opposition movement called Solidarity that uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, relates to the legacy and tradition of the Solidarity in Poland. So there is some kind of uh, internationalization of the ideas of, of the movement, uh, but eventually it depends on the domestic context of how and then uh, the knowledge about uh, various movements, not only in Poland, but in, in other parts of the world, in South Africa, uh, in Chile, in the Philippines, might be helpful for those uh, local civil resistors uh, in, in waging their own um, uh, struggle with the, with the oppressive regimes. Thanks, Dr. Bartkowski. Our next question comes from Bob Press. And he writes, thank you for a fascinating review of Poland's transition. I've seen examples of small-scale civil resistance in sub-Saharan Africa, individuals and very loosely connected groups of activists from various professions, journalism, lawyers, students, not sustained, few resources, yet they kept authoritarian rulers off balance. Aren't we missing such resistance? Has anyone else come across such examples? Um, and with small resistance, how do you measure impact? It's very hard to measure impact, but 
they do report abuses and give international actors a reason to intervene. Um, I'm not so familiar with the with the case of um, uh, Western Sahara, but uh, it probably depends um, in terms of understanding whether the resistance is small or, or large. That that's really um, that's a very subjective point of view, perhaps for the sub saharans that resistance is it's not a small uh, uh, by any means. Um, it's um, so I'm. I would be um, again. Um, we definitely there are various types of resistance. Not only uh, the kind of national scale resistance. They could be very localized resistance. In China, for example, there are uh, uh, hundreds of demonstrations taking place in villages and rural areas uh, that we don't know much about, but they are occurring, and uh, um, and uh, they might not be about. Um, challenging the dominant role of the Communist Party, uh, but actually about addressing certain uh, social uh, and economic and, and justice issues. Uh, for example, they, they could be movements against corruption. Um, and those movements, and I think that our work at ICNC is actually to try to um, collect that information, try to, and that's why we've got uh, the, the News Digest where we uh, try to bring to the larger public, to the, to the attention of the larger public, though those uh, resistances that are more localized, that are more that are smaller in sight, and they might not be noticed by the uh, corporate media uh, as much as the kind of national national wide uh, protests and demonstrations. Um, so one of the actual tasks of ICNC is to uh, present um, to larger a community of scholars, media, and, and organizers and activists, those struggles that are usually not on, 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 on our kind of mental and, and, and uh, uh, map and, and also on, 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 on media as such. Great, thanks. Um, the next question comes from uh, Abraham Maratayab. We had a, uh, some issues connecting with him vocally, but he typed in his question and he writes, how much were the civil resistance uh, resistance organizations supported by Western countries and organizations, and he means in the term like financial, financially, how are they supported, if at all? Right. Um, excellent question. I think there is always um, a sort of misconception about the role of third parties in civil resistance struggles. And uh, in the case of Poland, um, I would say that uh, um, uh, that support was uh, really very small. Um, first of all, uh, that support was mainly after um, uh, after 1981 um, in a form of um, donations, and and and, uh, and that would also include not only money but also include uh, clothes, food. Uh, but uh, civil resistance in Poland developed, as I showed, um, throughout the whole kind of uh, history of of, of communism in Poland. And um, um, up till the end of 70s, where I think major resistance work took already place where the underground uh, society uh, essentially has been uh, uh, way uh, has been developed and, and very much alive um, up till then um, there was not much support um, apart from the kind of verbal political uh, coming from from the West uh, in the 80s uh, when the solidarity had to go underground uh, again because of the of the martial law, that support was coming from various channels, but mainly, for example, in financial terms, 99% of this um, uh, solidarity uh, um, financial needs they were coming from uh, its own members. Um, as I said, there were 9, 10 million people that joined, that joined solidarity and made small donations. Uh, um, and um, and also that Western aid um, oftentimes came in the form of, for example, printing machines, uh, in the form of um, um, certain instruments that would help solidarity to um, uh, mainly actually to, to, to support the uh, printing publishing press rather than uh, in any other form as such, apart from, of course, the, the, the political um, uh, form. The award, uh, award of the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for Lech Wałęsa in 1983, that was uh, also a major um, uh, symbolic support that uh, Western uh, country actually offered to um, uh, to Poland. Um, so 
I would not. Uh, I would be hesitant to actually exaggerate uh, or tr uh, try to even see a, a large role of third parties uh, in in Polish uh, uh, civil resistance struggle, as it is actually the case in all other uh, civil resistance struggles. Um, uh, for example, right now in Iran. Um, and um, and uh, this support was really um, I would not even put that in a in a in a uh, material sense, but more in the in a kind of moral um, uh, symbolic terms. Great, thanks. Uh, we have time for one last question, and it comes from again Marie Odendahl, and she writes: You mentioned solidarity's egalitarianism. Can you give a gendered analysis? How patriarchal was solidarity's culture? What was the role of women in the movement, and did women take up their rightful places in politics and government after the elections? Great question, uh, difficult one. Um, actually, um, uh, till essentially till um, uh, the, the main leaders of Solidarity were arrested in 1981, women were more in a kind of supportive roles um, uh, rather than uh, in front of the, of the movement. Uh, but even then, with the arrest of the Solidarity uh, leaders uh, during the martial law, um, yeah, there were a number of women that took uh, various leadership positions in the regional structures, in the regional Solidarity structures, in uh, taking charge of uh, different um, uh, underground newspapers. Um, but uh, indeed, some of them, um, uh, of, of women, were still very much critical of the of the role uh, in in the resistance. I would I would actually argue that uh, civil resistance uh, gave um, opportunity for women as well as for other um, 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 uh, kind of groups um, uh, to to join that resistance as no other resistance would offer. Uh, if it was armed resistance, um, definitely it would rely would rely on the kind of physical strength of of a, a small number of uh, uh, males engaged in a kind of conspiracy against the, the, the communist government. Um, uh, so, uh, still, despite certain limitations, uh, uh, there was a certain empowerment, uh, particularly in that civic sphere, in the, in the building of the civic underground education that then eventually transformed in uh, women's participation in, the, in building civil society, including also um, independent media after the, after the change happened. It's true that um, uh, uh, there were not many actually women that entered uh, parliament um, in 1989. I don't know exactly the numbers, but they were not uh, really uh, significant. Actually, one could make an argument that perhaps during the communist times, um, uh, particularly, for example, in East Germany, there were uh, more women in parliament than after the transition uh, uh, in after 1989, simply because the uh, Communist Party had its own uh, quotas for how many women would, uh, would uh, enter the parliament. and uh, and those quotas were removed, um, and um, uh, and women um, might have even more difficulties in entering um, um, political structures and, and 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 parliament. But women became very a very uh, important uh, force in in terms of uh, uh, creating and leading very civic organizations after uh, Poland um, started democratization. So the, despite the fact that um, they were not, uh, there were not many women entering uh, politics, uh, they were present in other uh, important spheres of, of, the, of, the, of the civil society. Great. Dr. Bartkowski, thanks again for a wonderful presentation. I also want to thank all of you for logging in, joining us today for, uh, for today's webinar. I also want to remind you that we're going to send out the uh, PowerPoint slides to all of you later this afternoon. Uh, in addition to more resources that are connected uh, to this topic. We also have recorded today's webinar, and we'll make that available on our website um, sometime early next week. So please feel free to send those PowerPoint slides and, and the video along to your colleagues uh, and friends who may be interested in this topic. You also will be added, if you're not already, to our list of people who receive our Nonviolent Conflict in the News Digest, um, which goes out twice a week and keeps you up to date on civil resistance um, struggles and issues related to the topic happening around the world. Uh, with that, Dr. Bartkowski, do you have any concluding remarks? No, I would like to thank you uh, and, and, and thank the audience for participating in that webinar. And I will be available to answer any questions that might be submitted um, to you, Darren, and, uh, and submitted uh, via email. 
um, and naturally I can share um, uh, resources about violent and nonviolent resistance if requested as well.